Cool. So thank you for coming on today, Levi. I was lucky enough to have Levi as one of my head lecturers throughout my degree. And I can say that some of the classes with you were some of the best of my whole degree. Your, your approach you to much. teaching, your passion is really what stands out, I feel like. Because you don't, I feel like you you really care about teaching kid, teaching your students to do a good job and, you know, really enjoy what they're doing. It's not just simply a job, which I like, really like. And yeah, uh, maybe just to start off, would you like to talk about your professional journey and what led you up to becoming a lecturer at QT? Yeah, for sure. Um, first, thanks for those kind words. Really appreciate it. And thanks for having me on. So I think um, like most people in my position in um, as a senior lecturer in industrial design, I, I started in industrial design. So I did an undergrad um, here at QUT, which is, which is where I'm still working. So I've been here for quite a while. Uh, and I guess you know, through that process, it, it gave me an idea about um, sort of where I, where I wanted to go and what I wanted to do. Um, and for me, that was sort of, you know, I was always quite interested in the creative process of design, but also pretty interested in, in sort of the research and the, and the knowledge development side of things. Mm. Um, when I finished my uh, bachelor's degree, I was, I was doing quite a bit of freelancing here in Brisbane. And also I moved to Canada for a bit. So I was doing like packaging design. I did a little bit of work in aftermarket customs for Harley Davidson uh, bikes, which was pretty cool. Um, yeah. A, a bit of stuff in those kind of areas, contract work. Um, but yeah, mostly freelancing. Um, in Canada, I did a bit of design strategy, um, quite a lot of graphic design for clients in sort of the US and um, and also in Canada. Yeah. Through that process, um, and then when I came back uh, to Australia, that's, that's sort of when I started to explore um, design research. Mm. So one of my mentors, um, Professor Vesna Popovich, kind of reached out to me and asked me if I wanted to do some work on a on an airport um, research project. So at the time, this was a really big Australian Research Council grant um, in the millions of dollars, working around uh, human systems in the airport. So understanding what sort of you know people were doing in the airport. Um, so I ended up doing a PhD in um, understanding knowledge development in airport security screeners so that touched on areas like human computer interaction also human factors um and understanding kind of what these people were doing um how they were doing it and why they were why they were good at their job mm. that then rolled into um, a postdoc in the same area so I was, I was working in that space um as a researcher i was also doing a lot of sort of applied design industry projects specifically looking at how technology might develop in in different contexts so i looked at um, the agriculture sector identifying new technologies and and basically providing strategic advice on how those technologies might be deployed to improve productivity or improve well-being um, and just provide benefit mm. uh, to the sector um, you know through this whole pathway that that then kind of led me to um to lecturing so working in teaching as you kind of covered um just in the intro but also um working on research projects in different areas as well mm. and that yeah that brings me to now yeah, excellent you mentioned the the kind of connection between design and not always even a physical product kind of understanding the strategy or the the system behind how something works we mentioned that on the podcast before about how like design can be really powerful in that space and like we even mentioned it from like a political aspect like you know really understanding how the how the world works on a global scale and I'm um, using that design thinking to make like significant change in the world. And yeah, like, do, do you think that's something that you think will take over in the future? Like having designers in more, you know, areas of, um, you know, leadership so that they can make more informed ch choices about the world. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I, I think, um, that's sort of one of the observations that at least I've seen over, over my career since when I started, um, to now, I think, you know, traditionally industrial design was very product centric. There was a lot of manufacturing work, obviously, um, working in that space. Obviously, Australia um, has historically divested in manufacturing. We're trying to build it back up now. But so that that opens the door for other areas. Um, and I think parallel to those sort of developments, there's been a, a recognition of design. So from being like an add-on that that makes a product or a service or a system better to something that is 
basically necessitated now. You know, mm. if you want a competitive advantage, most of the companies, most of the product offerings, whether they're, you know, physical manufactured product or they're something digital or an experience, they have good design behind them. Um, you, I don't think you can have a good product without it now. And um, because industrial designers are, are trained in um, human-centered design, it makes us perfect for those environments. We can adapt to those quite easily. Uh, and we have as well. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's, it's, you talk about the, like in the past, I've had so many people talk about the battle of, you know, bringing design to light and making it be seen as a valuable thing to implement the business on all levels. Um, but yeah, like as you're saying, you, you think it's kind of the, the battle is somewhat being won, but I suppose it's 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 a continuous battle. <laughs> yeah, of course. I mean, I think there's a cost as well associated with these things. And um, I mean, you can tell when something <laughs> has the investment behind it, where there's there's been investment into that process and 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 the products and the services that haven't, you know, there's a big gulf between them. Uh, and consumers, you know, maybe not everyone's uh, recognizing that yet, but people are becoming more more savvy and and they they identify quality um, when they see it. Yeah. Um, how has your experience as an industrial designer informed your approach to teaching? I think um, you know, it, it's kind of about understanding what works for people. Uh, teaching is one of those things where I think um, as a as a product, it it has different parts of it obviously you design a lecture you design a a studio or or some sort of um you know tutorial activity you design the assessments um but making those i think resonate with people making them accessible to people um making students want to care about it you know that's that's kind of where the the, the hard part of it comes in mm. so you know i think it's understanding um, I guess the constraints of of your user. So in this case, students who are often don't have a lot of time. They're they're balancing a lot of a lot of things. Um, you have learners of all different skill levels, so you need to cater for those who maybe have no experience to those who are a little bit more experienced. Mm. Um, you know, by that I mean you want content to be accessible in a in an easy to accessible um, sort of manner, but you also want students who want to push it further to be able to do that. Mm. Um, so I think catering for for all sorts of groups and and really understanding you know how someone's going to interact with that content, how they're going to apply it, making sure that it's meaningful them meaningful for them, um, so they they see it as valuable, so they want to engage in it, they want to apply it and um and you know practice it and get good. Mm. Yeah, I always found your classes were very um, enjoyable because they were kind of what I expected industrial design to be from the beginning. Like they were, you know what I mean? They weren't like particularly um, academic, if you know what I mean? Like they were more like, like let's sketch this product out. Let's like, you know, like the, the one I always go to is the um, aesthetics and visualization class is like, you know, you understand the brand, you like draw the design language from the brand and then you apply it to like a, you know, inanimate, inanimate object that wouldn't be usually offered by the brand. And like, it was, it was a fun subject. Like it was kind of like the, the kind of work I would, um, I would have imagined that industrial design would have been. And I feel like we've, um, I mean, I suppose it's just because it's education has to be, you know, pretty the theoretical as well. Um, like a lot of the classes were, weren't necessarily what I would have expected industrial design to be, but I suppose yeah. it's because you've got to, you've got to offer a range of things. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I mean, that class is interesting. It's, it was, it's one of my favorite to teach, probably the favorite, um, uh, it has, like you say, all the the cool stuff that we do as designers. It's it's sketching. It's it's making stuff in CAD. It's mm -hmm. you know it's making stuff look awesome. Um, that's what it's all about. Uh, but it's kind of interesting you, the way that to hear you talk about it in that way because you know the first several weeks of that subject are actually pretty heavy with theory. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this but is it's fun. It's fun theory because it's like understand why this looks like that and understand like the symmetry and like the What's the yeah. word? I always forget the word you used. Um, when something consinity? like yeah, consinity. That's right. I remember I yeah. heard that word. I was like, "What is consinity?" <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I think too that's part of the unit design. Like, it would have probably been easy to to ask students to, yeah, you know, go research Bang and Olufsen products and write a fifteen page report on their aesthetics. But I think you know that's not really how we understand things, and it, and it's 
you know, aesthetics is one of those things where it's, you can quantify aspects of it, but the other part of it, um, as you know, is, is hugely subjective. Mm. So, you know, analyzing it from a sketching point of view, getting people to understand it compositionally, not mm. in a written format. Um, you know, that's what it's all about. And I, and I think that sort of practice of drawing things and representing their aesthetic qualities and um, principles visually, it, it helps then when you go to sketch something that's a derivative of that or an extrapolation of that, you can, you can then start to see those patterns and apply them in your own work. So it's, you know, it's that muscle memory process. And it, that's, you know, that's part of the design, I think, to, to try to make it, you know, obviously engaging, but also memorable, get reps up. Mm. I think it is important as well, because I suppose in a lot of jobs, you would have to do that. Like you'd have to, you know, understand the design language or the organization and then create products that fit within that ecosystem, not just completely different to anything they've ever made. So I think it is, it is definitely a useful subject as well. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think you'd, I mean, even, um, you know, if you're designing in a consultancy and you're, you've got a client, you need to apply their design language. Obviously that happens if you're designing a new product it needs to have a design language, something that's purposeful. Mm. And I think, you know, developing a design language is something that is, um, it's kind of, it's a bit of a trade secret, even though it's totally, you know, when we see a, a Ryobi drill or a, or a Porsche car, like we can see the design language, mm. but the actual, you know, the, the specification of what elements there are and how they need to be dealt with you know, mm. that's, that's often not available. So mm. um, equipping designers with the tools to be able to identify what those characteristics are and then produce their own is really important. Mm. You've already somewhat mentioned this, but um, how have you seen education evolve over the course of your career? Um, and what do you think the future holds for design education? Yeah, so I mean, one of the things that really stands out um, for me and in, in what we're trying to do in design education at, at QT is, is create those authentic experiences, things that are embedded with industry that, that have a connection that broaden the classroom to, you know, it's not just something where a, where a lecturer is standing up in front of you talking it, it, it brings in those, those constraints and those needs, um, from different stakeholders, mm. um, and I think that's, you know, that's been enabled in a lot of ways by um, design's reputation. So people thinking, knowing that, you know, design is actually a valuable um, tool in, in the arsenal and, and they want to be part of that. Mm. Um, so, so I think, you know, that's, that's very much, um, yeah, one, one characteristic of that. I think the other thing, you know, technology is, is huge. Um, when I was a student, there was, a handful of people that had a laptop mm. um that brought a laptop you know this is less than 20 years ago mm. um it, so it was a different type of engaging with with content now you know everyone has multiple devices and these they can do you know incredible things um as we've seen through the pandemic they've mm. allowed us to adapt to re remote learning mm. um yeah, so the way that content is engaged with is is more multimodal now. There's a lot less sort of just come to class, do the work, um, you know, in that sort of collaborative environment. There's it's a lot more distributed. So the way that we the way that we teach, the way that we create content, the way that we ask students to participate, um, you know, has to account for those things. Mm. Um, so you know, that's that's been a big change as well. Mm. But technology is a big one. Like even when I first started going, digital sketching wasn't even really that big then like it was, but not many people had, you know, graphics tablets with them or anything like that. And then by like the second year of my degree, everyone had it. I mean, for your class, it was a given. I think it was like you had to get a graphics tablet of some sort to do it. And yeah. um, which I feel like is good because I, I personally prefer like physical sketching, but graphics, like um, digital sketching is massive. Like everyone seems to be doing it these days. And I mean, um, I think you have to have that skill when you go into industry. So definitely makes sense. But even um, even like a bigger thing I wanted to ask you was like the emergence of AI. Like I graduated end of last year, which was kind of like, like I just missed the emergence of AI, which is quite interesting. Um, but now I, I wanted to ask you, because I spoke to Raf end of last year, or no, beginning beginning of this year, just before uni started. Um, and he said he's interested to see like what effects AI is going to have. But now you're you're in the midst of the first semester. So 
what like what effect have you noticed from AI? Um, is it positive? Is it negative? Um, and you know, are you implementing into your curriculum, or are you kind of hesitant from it? Yeah. Um. I mean, I'm a an absolute technology optimist, so I I think um and hope that it'll have a have a positive um effect on mm -hmm. on the industry and education as a whole. Um. You know, it's 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 one in a long line of technologies that have that have made things easier. Um, you know, we already have AI tools in Adobe, uh, in CAD. Mm. You know, this, this is kind of obviously, I think, a, a step forward because it's doing stuff that humans would normally create. Um, so in, in terms of the effect, it, it's it's kind of interesting. Um, and I mean, we, we haven't really seen the full effect of it yet, mm. um, but we are, you know, we are actively... I guess, building it into some of our units. Mm. Um, so an example I can uh, mention is, um, so one of our lecturers here, um, Dr. Dan Cook, is he's been using AI to create and iterate on personas. Mm. So basically feeding the systems information about um, user research and getting it to sort of write personas and mm. um, obviously gener generate images for those um, because you can have a sort of a discourse with things like chat GPT, you can start to refine it and you can, you can push and pull it, um, and, and get it to where you want. You know, obviously I think these are, these are kind of, um, forward exercises and, and to test how these technologies might be applied, um, you know, which is what we want to do. We don't want to be on the back foot with this sort of stuff. Um, there's clearly limitations in, in that sort of application, you know, personas are research based, um, to get information sort of, you know, firsthand and then see how these technologies, um, yeah, ad ad adapt to it. Mm. Um, I plan on using um, text to image AI in um, aesthetics and visualization next semester. So um, students, I think last year, a student, a couple of students um, had used it. Mm. Um, my, you know, my interest of it is because essentially the, the subject asks students to understand the visual style and then apply it to a new product category. Mm. Um, you know, that's a perfect job for a text to image um, AI, but you know, my initial experimentations with it are that the, the, the AI is not great at it. It, yeah. it creates an, an interesting starting point, mm. um, something that a student can interrogate, um, evaluate to see what it got right, what it got wrong, and then to iterate on that. So I'm really interested to see how students can use um, AI as a dialogue, not, mm. oh, I'm just going to create the thing with it. So how can they build it into the design process mm. in, this, in the same way that they would when they're constructing a mood board, when they go out and look for reference images and, and synthesize that information, how do they use AI in that process? Mm. Um, so I think, you know, that comes down to a, a responsible use of that technology. Um, I've also seen, you know, some of my colleagues um, using the technology to to great effect. So, um, like Bizcom, um, Stable Diffusion has it has a couple of um, great options where you can add sketches to the to the software, and it can basically iterate on it for you and and do different stuff with it. Um, you know, these are I think they're fantastic tools. Um, that you have to think critically about mm. the the worry that I would have is that if someone not experienced with the design process starts to use these and thinks, well, that is the design process, or I can't do any better than that. You know, that's where we start to have a problem because then, you know, where we're not really advocating for ourselves and using it in a, in a responsible way. So, as, you know, as much as it has great potential, I think there's, there's some things, um, yeah, we, we need to kind of look out for. And um, so I'm, I'm part of a, a research group looking at um, AI and the perceptions of it in um, learning and teaching. Mm. Um, so there's a bunch of us from, from different um, disciplines within the faculty. So education, visual arts, uh, as well as design. And we're basically looking at um, getting student perspectives, industry perspectives, and even and staff perspectives to see kind of um, where they see the potentials, where they see the mm. the threats, um, so that we can anticipate some of these problems uh, moving for, forward as we as we adopt it into the curriculum. Mm. I suppose it's kind of like the battle between like 
these days, I mean, a lot of people in my degree kind of didn't sketch. Like I was even, I fell into that trap for a while. Like I, you know, focused on CAD, but it's kind of like, you can't just, you can't just do CAD. You've got to sketch and do CAD. And it's the same way. You can't just use AI. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you've got to incorporate it into your process. And if you have that approach, you'll probably be more successful with it. Um, an interesting thing I heard about the other day is using um, ChatGPT and MidJourney in collaboration. So you use ChatGPT to write a really good prompt for MidJourney. So you get a more accurate, like fleshed out version of what you're wanting. Um, so it has better responses. And then even like using MidJourney to create like bump maps and like textures for keys for Keyshot. That sounds like a really interesting application because like you just, you know, you quickly just want something made up and, you know, you have like a specific prompt, you use ChatGPT to like, you know, finalize it a bit more. I feel like for that application it could be really interesting. Mm. yeah 100 percent. and you know this is it's been around for you know a minute at this point yeah. um and people are already using it in really interesting ways mm. uh, you know and that's an example of a really creative application where it's it's saving someone time in their workflow mm. it's it's adding value to that process mm. um and, you know and i think that's that's kind of where the potentials you know for us can be mm. do you think we'll ever be like write your your 3d model script you will ever get that far <laughs> uh, i mean potentially there's uh like viscom does mesh creation like from sketches um to meshes and you know maybe it does that but i, I think you know um <laughs> if we're designing products for manufacture mm, very hard that's mm. yeah it's it's hard I'd i'd be interested to see how it goes with that i think probably what we get is I mean, we already have simulation tools and all sorts of stuff that are built into, into CAD. So um, it probably makes it easier to make a manufactured product um, because you can have AI and it can sort of triage your shoes a lot quicker than what you would, um, you know, going through the prototyping and tooling process. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, that sort of stuff can add a huge amount of value in the product development pipeline. So, you know, I guess that there's probably a problem with it you just ask it, design me a, you know, the next generation of this bicycle and it pumps it out for you. Mm. Um, that's a bit of a worry, but yeah. you know, if it can, if it can interact and engage in that process of design, then I, I think that's a win for everyone. Yep. Yeah. Cool. How do you balance theory and practice in your teaching and how is it important for aspiring designers to follow this practice? Yeah, that's, a, that's an awesome question. Um, I think, I think, I mean, for me as a, you know, I, I came through a PhD program and I, and I still do academic research, write papers that, you know, it's, it's really easy for me to add theory to my work. Um, I'm always engaging with it. Uh, I think, you know, but I also came from a design background um, and, you know, I absolutely believe in the the power of design and, and I weave design into the work that I do mm. um, to make it innovative to make it um engage better with people so you know that that's kind of where you where i see the balance of it is um it, yeah being able to sort of marry those two to make it the best possible product and i think that's you know your question around how to how do you weave that into teaching um i touched on it a little bit earlier with with discussion around aesthetics and visualization and, and that that unit of teaching is to try to you know weave in that theory so that it's in a really accessible way, it's in an understandable way, and so that it actually appears to be a value for a student because mm. you know we're in the business of designing, um, so if that theory can be applied to design to make that design work better, uh, you know then that's kind of the benchmark for making sure that those two areas are balanced. Mm. Um, one of the approaches that that I've kind of taken in um, in my lectures and in in my teaching is to kind of demonstrate, you know, the theoretical background um, and then the the applied nature of of, of those things. So, um, an example is um, user experience. So, you know, this is a big part of design. Experience is a really old research field. Understanding you know, the psychological elements of experience, how we experience the world. Designers didn't make that up. Um, it's it's not really ours to own, but we use it 
you know, when we're, when we try to understand someone's experiences with tools that we use, whether these are, um, you know, personas or journey maps or packed analyses, you know, we're drawing on theory, we're drawing on psychological theory about experience and we're packaging them in into design tools. Um, so that's something that I try to demonstrate in lectures without going on and on about it. Um, you know, like it's useful to understand the background so that you can understand how we need to think about these things and represent them mm -hmm. in a tool that helps us to design. So it's, yeah, presenting it as a theoretical concept, showing how we actually apply it in design and then in class um, getting students to apply it. So that sort of step-by-step -step process to make them uh, appreciate, you know, where this knowledge has come from, mm. but also equip them with the tools so that they can use it for productive purposes. Mm. Yeah, I think that is a good strategy. I mean, even for my, for, in, for my personal experience, I feel like I took in information a lot better when I could see the direct application to, you know, to something I would do in work, opposed to just like, you know, I had to do it because of a university assignment kind of thing. Um, so I think in that way, it makes a lot of sense and it helps people kind of, you know, it helps their mind prioritize that information to actually remember it. Because that's isn't that's the thing with the mind. Like if you if if you think it's a priority to remember, you'll remember it. But if you just think it's a pointless piece of information, you won't. So I suppose it's like even important from just a learning perspective. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think too, from you know, when you're when you're applying um concepts in design, it almost acts like memory hooks. So mm -hmm. if there's a you know, if you're referencing theory, you know, this is why we do this, this in this particular way. Um, and then that's linked up with that tool and that application, you know, the, then all those things are connected in memory and you really, you start to understand it. Um, it's just sort of the same thing with history, um, philosophy, whatever else is connected to the process of designing. These are really important things that we understand so that we have that vocabulary, um, and we can we can convey designs and explain, yeah, this is this is why I did it that way because mm -hmm. that's the process. Um, in terms of in terms of the importance of collaboration in the field, how do you foster that in the classroom? I know with um, I was I was part of the remote classes, and I know it was quite hard, definitely early on, to make the change to remote learning and still have that collaborative aspect, especially in design. I don't think design's really designed for like collaborative teaching necessarily. There can be a lot of challenges. Um, but yeah, how do you foster that and how do you, you know, improve that experience in university? Yeah, but it's, it is tricky. Um, I, you know, I, I mentioned earlier, we, the, the modalities of teaching a change, there's, there's kind of students who are really engaged and want to be in, in the classroom, in the studio. Then there's those who are kind of more in, happy to be working more independently. Uh, and then there's those who, <laughs> who want to do do zoom learning so um yeah combining all those into something that works um is is certain re certainly really challenging i think my general approach to it has been about i think collaboration works well when there's structure mm. um so in a typical class that i would teach where there's group work or where i really want there to be a collaborative environment i would start with quite a high amount of structure. So I'd have activities um, that involve, you know, specific prescribed steps that students would work through. Mm. Um, and that kind of gives them the framework or the scaffolding to work together because they have the process in front of them to begin with. And then over time, you start to remove that scaffolding, you remove that structure. Um, mm. But, you know, they have the prototype of how to, how to work and, and how to do that engagement. Mm. Um, and I think that works in in lots of different modes. Um, I uh, during the pandemic, I coordinated a fabrication unit online. I remember this. Uh... Uh, yeah, which was really hard because that you know that unit was about being in the workshop and working on tasks um, together. And when it was in person, you know, we had amazing attendance because we were in a workshop environment that students couldn't normally access at home. They saw value in coming in together because they had that facility. There was structured activities for them to sort of work through. Um, so there was, a, there was a lot of incentive to come together and work together. Mm. Then, you know, we went online and, and students weren't meant to see anyone. <laughs> they weren't meant to go out unless they were buying 
essentials. So we really had to be creative about how that sort of collaboration was working. Um, so it became more a intellectual collaboration. So coming up with shared ideas mm. where the making became separate, but the commonality between those two approaches was that there was structure. It, it wasn't just a matter of saying, all right, you guys are working together, go and make it happen. Mm. It was all right, you're working together. Here's a bit of structure to basically help, um, I guess, propel that work. And then once you have a good understanding of how everyone works together and what you're doing, you can remove that structure and it, and it yeah, typically yeah. works better. Yeah. Yeah. I think from, um, like from my perspective, I had one year on, on campus in the beginning, two years off campus and in online and then one at the end in, in campus again. And like, I barely knew anyone from the first year of my uni and I barely made any friends while I was online. And I kind of just became this like, digital nomad that just like never left my room you know what I mean because like what else was I gonna do and then I, like when I rejoined society I felt like I was, I'd become like a I don't know like a, like a social introvert because I wasn't used to talking to people um yeah. and and then when I went back to uni I made really good friends in the last year and like those friends I still keep in touch with so I feel like I did miss out somewhat on that on the university experience and like I suppose that's just that's just the struggle of like working um especially because like I think maybe if you, if you design a course to be online you can have more like success with it but if you have a course that's designed to be in person and then like mm -hmm. over the span of what like a month you had to make it an online course it becomes very hard to you know design the experience so that the user so the um student actually has that kind of university experience but but yeah. overall like I still enjoyed my time online but I think that yeah it was it was never the same as being in person yeah yeah I agree I mean I think design is inherently a physical interactive experience um and you, you identify some really critical points there. Um, there's a, yeah, I mean, with, with students who are kind of just finishing now or have finished like yourself and and those coming in, I, I think, yeah, COVID kind of, yeah, it set up a bit of, a bit of a precedent about how things can be done. Mm. Um, and we're seeing the fallout for that. Um, I think that that interactivity, knowing the cohort, I think, you know, what you think about traditionally in a design studio is, is students coming together, working mm. in an area and there being a really good on-campus culture mm. and that sort of stuff will come back, but, you know, we, we have to work towards it. Um, we've got a really good group of students at the moment um, in the industrial design society trying to do that to create events and, and get networking and mm. I guess meeting different people that aren't just in your immediate class trying to facilitate those things um we've got a new workshop precinct being built which which we see is somewhere where students will sort of hang out and be doing that sort of work so mm. yeah trying to trying to bring that back is a is a real priority for us and because if you can build that culture that grows organically then that's going to translate into the classroom as well because you have that mm. collegiality and that group mindset yeah definitely i'm um, just moving on from that how do you stay up to date with the latest technologies and advances in design Obviously, it can be quite hard to implement them because with university, you have to kind of, you know, keep start the process, get the ball rolling. Um, you can't just, you know, quickly implement it. Uh, yeah, how do you kind of balance that and make sure you still stay up to date with the with the current technology trends? Yeah, I think um, with design, we're sort of, we're always looking at technology and better ways to do things. So we're probably inherently built um, to want to do that. Um, an example that we have is is sort of using, um, you know, VR and Gravity Sketch. We we have that built into a, a couple of units, and um, we have a good relationship with with Gravity Sketch, mm. sort of bring that in. And there's a couple of academics, um, Dr. Tim Williams um, specifically, and and Andrew Peterson, mm. uh, who are sort of leading that initiative and and sort of building that in. I think, you know, with those types of examples you also need to have a willingness to experiment um and and this comes i guess this relates as well to a lot of our work with with industry partners so you know over the years um we've 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 worked with a lot of them um at the moment i'm teaching a unit where we're working with beam mobility and brisbane bmw uh, we obviously have the bmw academy um, we've had lots of partners um, such as uh, from uh, Metro North Hospital, um, Spinal Life. Uh, there's also been like Alstom, formerly Bombardier. So we try to in integrate these experiences 
also technologies like um, like Gravity Sketch into the unit and build projects around them, um, which is you know which is great if you can work with industry and you can work with technologies that are sort of on the fringe, uh, then you can really you know you can dictate sort of how they're being used and you can be part of that group who are kind of pushing them and understanding them. Mm. Um, but yeah, it really comes down to that sort of openness to experiment because when you throw in an unknown like that, or you start working with industry partners, um, you know, not everything's going to go super smooth. Uh, it's, you know, sort of feeling each other out and, and sort of understanding that. Um, but I think, you know, doing that sort of work is, is really valuable and really rewarding. Uh, mm -hmm. and by its very nature, if you're engaging with industry and you're engaging really strongly with the field and the technology that you're working within uh, then you will be at that cutting edge you will be seeing what's coming through and, and understanding how it works and how you can apply it mm. i suppose it also makes it hard because when you think about technologies like vr for example like they're not even necessarily used in the wider industry like there's specific niche groups that would be implementing it into their workflow but like the standard industrial design job in australia wouldn't use vr so it's like kind of hard to balance like what you know, maybe the technology trends are that people should be learning for the next like 10 years and like what is actually going to get someone a job right now. Like it'd be quite hard to balance that. So. Yeah, that's right. I mean, you know, we still we still rely on our core, like we're teaching CAD, we're teaching industry leading software and, and those practices. Um, but, you know, with the emerging technology stuff, it, it's kind of interesting. Um, we actually, so talking with sort of the industry, um, and where students are going, uh, you know, we're, we're fairly well connected with that. And often what we find is that it's the grads that are getting those entry-level jobs who are introducing the technologies into those practices. Yeah. Um, like an ex example of that is um, Ben Donnelly. He graduated a number of years ago now, and, and you know, he's been working on um, as a concept designer on like Marvel films, legendary films. And um, yeah, and he, he basically introduced VR into some of that workflow. So to insert models mm. that were created so that people could engage with them at sort of life size and see how they looked at scale. Um, and those sort of, you know, and, and that, I guess, initiative then got him to do a presentation to kind of the, you know, the set designers and the managers to sort of see how they might be able to use that. Mm. Um, and we hear about that sort of stuff kind of regularly where, you know, because university is is such a, a rich area for for experimenting you can take those sort of risks as a student and yeah. as a student and and follow your your interests um then they get applied in practice because you know you have an advocate for it and and that sort of that sort of knowledge development experimentation and, and then um and communicating that that knowledge is really important i think mm. yeah i definitely think like i use gravity sketch for my final subject my capstone subject and like, maybe it wasn't that practical, but it was so much fun and it gave me a chance to really learn the software. And like, yeah, I definitely think I know what you're talking about. Like when I go into my first position, I definitely think down the track, I will try and implement, you know, VR into my workflow because I see the benefit to it. But like, maybe if you're a, you know, a designer who's been working full time for the last like 20 years, you haven't had that time to, you know, pick that software up and, you know, give it a go. And also I suppose younger people are probably a bit more flexible with like implementing new softwares. Um, and I suppose like that's the benefit of employing a graduate because I know like it's quite hard to get a job as a graduate um, in Australia or, or anywhere. But um, because a lot of people probably don't see like the benefit of putting the money and the time into training them up. But like I suppose that is one benefit is that they're very flexible and they might bring you know some of their like unique technical knowledge. I mean, um, technology knowledge into your business. Mm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think you know anything that you can have is like a competitive advantage helps obviously you need to have you need to show the core skills mm. um you know demonstrate how you can uh, contribute to to the business and and do what they need to do um but you know if you can if you can make things more efficient um then that's that's you know great as well i mean with things like you know vr it, it gives that sort of remote interactive opportunity you can um you can prototype it one is to one you can stand inside a vehicle or you can stand inside something and and look at sort of reach distances and and do those sort of things that normally would require like you know a massive investment mm. um so it's yeah not only understanding the technology um, in terms of how to use it but 
I guess knowing how it could actually add value to a business. Um, yeah, I think that's that's key as well. And I guess being strategic about it. So not just, oh yeah, I know, I know how to use VR, but hmm. I know how to use VR and and these are the things that it can do. This this is how it can contribute and make things better. Yeah. Do you think you're gonna be teaching in the metaverse one day? You'll just have me there with your VR headset up. <laughs> I certainly hope not. Um <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, I I like to, you know, I like to sit with students, stand in front of people, sketch stuff and and collaborate like that. I mean, I, I, yeah, who knows if if it's the right opportunity, um, we can do that. Um, I think it's, you know, it's, it's a tool, not necessarily a replacement, but it can certainly contribute. Yeah. I mean, if you, if you're overseas and, you know, you want to like study in Australia, I, I suppose it makes sense, but I agree. I think like I think it's very hard to replicate the human experience and especially like the interactiveness with students. Like, you know, you're probably not going to foster the same friendships through VR as you would in reality. Who knows? Maybe in like 10 years, it'd be the same. But um, right now, I just don't see how you could get the same experience. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think honestly, when, when we came out of the pandemic, I don't know if there was too many people thinking, oh yeah, that was the future. Everyone <laughs> just hanging out alone it's it's you need to have uh, interaction and, and networking and um yeah it's you know it's part of the human experience i think so it'll be augmented that's for sure mm. but i don't think it'll it'll go away or, or i hope it doesn't go away entirely yeah i really i think like for me like oh you're you're not feeling well today you take a sick day and you can still tune in for that day and actually have like a relatively yeah. interactive experience that makes sense but i think yeah, as a complete experience, it's not really what I'm looking for, what I would ever look for, yeah. Um, 100%. How do you foster creativity and innovation in your students and what strategies have you found most effective in enhancing that? Man, that's a, that's a, that's a tricky question. Honestly, I, I think um, obviously the, the first part of it is make the task enjoyable. Um, I mean, I think the best conditions for creativity are, are just you know, make someone want to do it. There has to be that um, intrinsic motivation where they want to be engaged in it. So if it's, if it's fun, if it resonates with them, if it, if it's meaningful to them, then you're, you're naturally going to get that, that sort of buy-in. Uh, it's not going to feel like a, a chore or, a, you know, a labor, um, you know, and that comes down to the activity design, the assessment design, um, how you're sort of doing things um, as well. The other thing I think is is definitely a like a, a growth mindset. So I guess instilling that belief that they can actually do it. There's a there's a mastery experience in there for someone. Um, make it achievable, uh, and that that can be you know there's lots of different strategies for doing that. Um, I think you know part of that is that like encouraging that iterative building up so you know I guess yeah fostering that sort of iterative work um I think part of that can come from just how you know someone like myself or another educator interacts with a student like if they need help you know sit down and sort of sketch through that process and 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 show them how they can explore ideas and, and build those ideas up mm. other you know other students are maybe a little bit more independent around that um you know, but in those cases, you can challenge, you can, sure, you've, you know, you've got to point A, but what have you tried to push that even further? What have you tried to like, um, you know, get better? And I, you know, that that's part of it. I think a big part of it as well is like, you know, designing the outcome. Um, and what I mean by that is, it's really thinking hard about what the actual outcome is, you know, for a student. So, and how that's going to benefit them. Are they excited about producing it? Um, so like, you know, this is, are we asking students to write a report? Are we asking them to, to make a high fidelity model and, and, a, and sort of opposed to focusing on different areas? Um, if that, if that sort of outcome is, is going to give them a good reward, then you're naturally going to get that buy-in. Uh, if it's not, then they're just, you know, they'll do it. They'll, they'll get it done because they need to get the grade, but they're not going to, again, coming back to that intrinsic motivation, uh, they're not going to have that element. Mm. Um, 
and all those things together, I think, you know, they, they just foster time, like mm-hmm. people putting time into something, um, creative creativity. Yeah. It can happen with a spark, obviously, but mm-hmm usually that spark is because of a lot of prior work it's Mm. you know it's about making those connections between different things and if you if you sit down for five minutes you're probably not going to make those connections but if you're habitually working on something and synthesizing information from different areas you're truly enjoying something Mm. then then i think that that spark that creativity that propensity for innovation um, will come out of that eventually but Mm. yeah it takes a bit of work Mm. yeah it definitely is a very fulfilling field i feel like maybe specifically for the type of person I am, but I think most people having that spark, as you, as you say, that like creative spark, you know, having an outlet where you can put your creativity into something. I feel like it's very fulfilling in life. Like I don't think I was ever, you know, when I, when I left school, I was going into um, IT at, at university and I don't know if I was ever really cut out for that. I think I would have definitely ended up unfulfilled. So yeah, I think it's, I think this, this kind of space for anyone creative, like whenever I meet someone, who's very creative and, you know, doesn't know what they're doing. I'm like, look into design, some form of design. You'll like it. Yeah, yeah totally. I mean, look, that was, um, I think that's what led me into it. Mm. Like, I think, you know, when I was 18, I, I kind of just wanted to draw. Um, I, wanted, <laughs> I wanted to do art, but I realized, um, you know, maybe that's not going to give me the best career prospects. So, mm. you know, when you, when you look at what, what is applied art, design comes up. It's it's yeah. got that balance of of technical, meaningful, you know, outcomes that can benefit people, but it, but it's mm. you know it's just heavy with creativity as well. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Um, in your opinion, what are the biggest challenges facing industrial design today? Ooh. Um, <laughs> I, I yeah, that's a that's a big question. Uh, probably look, I I mean. There's obviously a lot um, of those. Uh, obviously, we touched on one before, which is which is AI. Um, I think we also have, you know, not just AI like Mid Journey and um, and those sort of things uh, like Dali, but there's also, I mean, we have stuff like, I mean, not so much industrial design, but like you know, Canva. We have automation in CAD. Um, so these companies are, you know, they are trying to sort of um, gear these products to to making things a little bit easier. Um, that's that's certainly a challenge. Mm. Um, but I think just you know staying on top of things is is going to be the the key element for industrial design. as a as an industry, it it's evolved and changed, and I definitely see that continuing. So where industrial designers can add value to things, um, you know, as this sort of discussed earlier, we've had a focus on um, or previously had a focus on sort of manufactured products and we've started to move into other areas. Um, society and industries are going to going to continue to evolve. Um, mm-hmm. So making sure that we're, you know, that we're across those evolutions um, will be really important. You know, I, I don't think um, there's anything necessarily specific in that. It it covers a lot of things from society's needs, uh, technology, um, you know, all that sort of stuff. Um, making sure that we're equipped with the with the right skills to address, um, I guess, life as it continues to evolve will be a, you know a critical aspect. Yeah, yeah. The design mindset or the design thinking always pushed in university, and I do think having that that kind of perspective on life really changes everything about your life and like the way you look at things like even even just from a even not even from a you know professional aspect just even just going through life I look at things and I look at I look at it from a design aspect like why is it why is it made that way now I look at products and what well, I think it was in um design for manufacturing class I can't even remember what the class is called but like he said look at look at things around the house and, and understand why like why is it made that way how is it made that way and like that, that kind of thinking is really interesting. Like you look at a, a bottle and you're like, oh, I know that that's got the injection molding marks. Like the mold was made this way. And like, you know, they were pins that injected out, like just simple things like that. Um, I feel like it's a really interesting way to look at life, to understand more of how things are made. Hmm. Yeah, a hundred percent. I think, you know, that that's sort of part as well of like understanding what the ro- role of the designer is. Um and and that's you know that sort of stuff is going to change um, over time. I, you know, obviously, um, 
a, a big issue coming up is well not coming up but that we're all sort of grappling with is sustainability um that was my next question des <laughs> yeah designers you know we're in the business of creating stuff really um not all of that stuff is you know like plastics and, and metal and mm -hmm. and so on um but that's that's still a big part of it and we're, we're also in a society where um you know progress is measured by economic growth um <laughs> every country around the world is is trying to grow at a certain percentage and that produces well that involves producing stuff that that people buy um how much can we continue going on with that um and to what extent can the the processes that we're developing like circular economy um, sustainability practices mitigate mitigate the negative impact of that mm. um I think that's probably an area where design um, hasn't and society in, in general, um, economics, like policy, you know, hasn't put enough, um, I guess, uh, in sort of instruction and knowledge around like, mm -hmm. under, you know, everyone understands sustainability to a degree, but, but knowing what you can actually do to enhance it, what are the, what are the practices um, that can be done to achieve that and how sort of working that system can, can improve um, the outlook. I, I think that that's going to be a, a, a big thing moving forward um, that we sort of need to overcome and, and put some more resources into. Mm. I suppose it comes back to like the greenwashing trend. It makes it a bit difficult because even from industrial design perspective, like you could very simply look at the materials and the manufacturing methods and just kind of design it to be sustainable from that aspect. But there's always going to be so many things that aren't taken into account. And like designing something completely sustainable from all aspects is very difficult. And and often as well, it it requires a complete overhaul of the current system we're living in. You know, like it doesn't even necessarily fit within the system that's currently here. So that that makes it even more challenging. Yeah, that's right. Um, you know, and even things like, uh, you know, recycling, um, that circularity, you're still producing stuff, mm. um, you know, with virgin materials that are entering that cycle. You're never really, you're never really taking them out. Um, the only way for like for, with plastics, for example, really the only way to, to deal with it is not to produce stuff from plastic, which um, I don't think is really, it's really, it's not really an option. Plastic's an amazing material. It, it has mm it's so beneficial to so many industries, mm. you know, look at healthcare, for example, um, mm. we just wouldn't be able to do the things that we do without it. Um, but we certainly need strategies to minimize, um, minimize that impact. And they, they probably, you know, it's not just a design problem. It, it comes from so many different areas. Um, mm. And it's, it is, it's hard to, to know how that might be addressed. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Um, can you speak to the role of research in industrial design um, and how you encourage your students to engage with the f aspect of this field? Yeah, I mean, I'm a big advocate for research. Um, it's it's a big part of my job, uh, so I really have to be. Um, and, and I think in, embedding it into the design process, you have to be kind of strategic about doing that. Um, there's also, like anything, there's a limit to how much you can do it. Mm. Um, I'm not going to ask my students to go spend, you know, a huge amount of time on research and make sure that's kind of finished and, until they start designing. I think, um, you know, for me, it's about how, in, how can we sort of develop effective research practices in design mm -hmm. that are kind of efficient, that allow you to get a starting point and then start that design process. So, so usually for me, that's that's a rapid research um, process, which you know predominantly involves primary research. Um, you know, most of the units I teach are a design, um, where they're designing something for someone. Um, so the most beneficial thing is is primary research mm -hmm. interviews, observations with actual people to understand what they're doing. Um, but getting the design process to start fast. Um, really as the research process is happening um, because design is, you know, it's as much as it's a process of solving problems, it's also that process of understanding problems. Mm. Um, 
And as we design and as we research together, um, we, we do get a better understanding of, of what the problem is um, over time. We might reframe the problem several times over. Uh, and the most effective way to do that is to combine research and design because you're basically gaining information, then testing those, that information as assumptions in the design. It'll either work out or it won't. That'll force you to basically collect some more information mm. um, and, and roll that process uh, together. So, so I very much see it as a, yeah, a, as a combined process, which is quite different to the the research that I'm doing, you know, as an academic and um, academic research, you have a more systematic approach to it where you're kind of doing the research, developing the outcomes, and then you're applying that somewhere. Um, yeah. But I, I don't necessarily think that process works too well in, in education. It's, mm. it's that integrated research to develop understanding from, you know, thinking and doing at the same time. Mm. I saw that you're currently working on a research project um, with the, the bracelets. What, do you yep. want to explain that, that process, that project? Yeah. So um, a couple of colleagues of mine, um, Dr. Nathan Bose, who's a chemist, a chemist and uh, Dr. Heather McKinnon. Um, yeah. So we, we got a, a grant to work on this project around developing UV sensing wearables for Australians in sort of the young category, like 18 to 30. Mm. Um, our, our kind of, you know, our, our basic uh, goal was to design things that would integrate better with people's lives. Mm. Most, a lot of the products on the market, uh, most of them, in fact, um, you know, things like, um, they're like these electronic clips. They're pretty ugly. Mm. Um, they're usually pretty bulky. Often they need to connect to an app. Um, yeah, they're, they're just not stuff that you would really want to wear. Mm. Um, so our kind of assumption um, that we tested through a series of design workshops were that, you know, people do a lot of different things. Um, maybe these products aren't particularly uh, applicable to those environments mm. so how can we design um, uv wearables that actually integrate better uh, with people's lives and the things they do and this can be stuff like you know going to the beach um, hiking stuff that we would normally associate with sun safety but then also things like commuting and just sort of going to cafes and, and doing whatever else um, that we might not um, so what we ended up designing were essentially like jewelry um, we were designing rings bracelets um, necklaces earrings but the technology that we used behind it was um, so it was developed um, from the chemistry team it's, it's called a photo switch mm. um, so it's essentially a powdered material that when it goes in the sun it changes color um, which is not you know in itself particularly exciting there's materials that do that mm. um, already um, photochromic materials, for example. Um, but one of the interesting things about this molecule is that when you take it out of the sun, it doesn't immediately switch back to its original color. So it essentially allows us to measure a cumulative dose. Um, and that's really important because that's basically what we do when we, when we go out in the sun, you know, we might go out, walk around for 10 minutes, sit in the shade for a bit, then go back out in the sun. Um, but, you know, through that process, it's not like it's resetting the sun that we've had. It's, it's cumulatively building on it. So um, yeah, so we integrated um, that molecule that can change color over time into a photopolymer resin, which basically meant that we could 3D print whatever we wanted with it. Um, so people can use it. It, it shows their cumulative dose um, and then they can switch it back, you know, when they finish the activity that night, whenever they get a chance and they can just use it again um, over and over again, basically. Mm. Yeah. So um, it's, it's in progress at the moment. Um, we've, we've had a, a couple of, you know, wins with it on media um, through like channel nine news and um, like Sydney morning Herald mm. who featured some stories on it. Um, but now we're looking to, to develop it further into something bigger. Um, and that involves a couple of things. So looking at, uh, potential industry partners to mm. to invest um, or look at another another type of research project so like an mm. Australian Research Council grant or something where we can explore the application of that in, in different environments and see how it actually changes behavior yeah it definitely sounds like something important especially in Queensland where we have some of the highest cancer rates in the world so I think yeah something like that could definitely be beneficial because a lot of time in Queensland it's hard to tell 
even how strong the sun is you know mm-hmm. like it's not always the hottest days that are actually damaging the skin so i suppose yeah something like that could be very beneficial mm. yeah i think you know you have to just assume you're pretty much always at risk in queensland um but yeah i mean for us it's something that you know you can wear it and it, and it doesn't kind of you don't have that thought oh, i don't really want to put this on you know a lot of people we found feel like they should wear sunscreen or they should wear a hat but it mm. doesn't really fit with what they're doing that day mm. like you know it it doesn't fit their aesthetic or they just couldn't be bothered carrying it around so they just mm. don't do it um mm. so to, trying to design things that could seamlessly fit into those sort of um situations provide some information to allow you to allow a person to act on it um mm. that's that's really what we're aiming to do yep yeah it's very user-centric opposed to just a product that no one's going to implement yeah it's a good approach to take. Um, how do you see the field of industrial design evolving in the next five to 10 years? And how do you pre- prepare students for these changes? I want to see crazy ideas, future thinking. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look, you know, what will industrial design even be in in, <laughs> in five to 10 years? Um, I mean, at least from our grads, I would say that we're we're generating more and more multidisciplinary designers. Mm. They're not just your traditional industrial designer. They're, they're adaptable um, to many different contexts. Every student, every person who's coming through and entering the industry will have their own narrative and their own journey. Mm. Um, so I, you know, part of it, I think is that flexibility to be able to choose where you want to go and what you want to do. Mm. Um, the other part of that, I think, is uh, it's a concept that you mentioned a little bit earlier, um, and that's you know design leadership, mm. and just continuing to enhance that. Um, we're already, I think, having great wins. Like you know, you have the um, you have people in that with design backgrounds in leadership positions who are strategically um, directing where different companies are going and and what's sort of happening they're having that management and leadership impact and i see that as as just growing basically over time um so you know we're not just the person that's changing the color or determining what something looks like but it's yeah in those strategic strategic positions um so i mean I think that's that's probably where it's going um and, and that yeah that adaptable sort of pathway so that designers can go into lots of different fields um i mean i'd expect and already have seen um designers in like you know crazy areas um where they're they're you know rightfully positioned um informing policy informing direction mm. you know, they're basically at the wheel um so to speak do you think QT could offer a double degree politics and design in the future? <laughs> uh, hey, maybe a, a designer as PM. That would be kind of interesting. Um, <laughs> no more lawyers. I think, yeah, I mean, maybe not specifically politics, but but certainly um, strategic design. Uh, that's that's something. Um, it, you know, the, these sort of courses are already offered. Um, mm. But I think it's a logical next step to have sort of business leaders and industry leaders. Um, that that have a design background Mm. there's a lot of benefits of doing that um i think because you know most designers um are sort of human-centered user-centered they they want to consider the best possible outcomes those preferable futures um as it's known uh you know so having the agency to be able to direct I guess, decision-making and, and actions towards those states um, is really important. And to do those things, you really have to be in a leadership position. Yeah. So that's, yeah. Yeah, it's very exciting. Um, can you speak to the role of empathy in design and how you encourage students to consider this? This kind of comes into what we were just talking about, having the empathy in whatever role you're in. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, it's kind of... Um, essential to to what we're doing if we're designing for people we have to be able to understand where they're coming from what their what their needs are we have to be able to put aside our own assumptions to be able to listen to someone um, to really hear their story and what their needs are you know I think those are skills that um, 
different people have to different extents, but but they're certainly, um, you know, they're certainly something that can be learned over time. Without that, without empathy, I really, I really don't know what what you're doing. Um, you know, you, you're just kind of producing something that, uh, you know, uh, who's it who's it for? Do you really understand? You know, what the purpose of it is. Mm. Um, in terms of fostering that. It's. I think it's. It's almost just a that repetitive question of why. Like, why are you doing that? Does this need? What to is the? Yeah. yeah, exactly. So you know, um, and that's that kind of like the metacognition, like understanding your own thinking processes, mm-hmm. um, because it can be really easy to you know. Oh, I need to design a a scooter for this company, for example. You just design a scooter like anyone can kind of do that um but to design that really effectively you know it's, it's sort of understanding a range of different people and having the willingness to engage with them talk with them understand those requirements um so if if you're reinforcing that question why um you know as an educator but i think also as a designer like continually sort of questioning um you know why am i putting that in place, having that really purposeful action um, about process, um, being rigorous about what sort of information you're synthesizing and and making sure that it's the right sort of information. Um, Yeah, so it it has to be something that is, I think, self-directed. But certainly you you can hammer it home um, by asking those questions of why. Mm. I'm just getting to the end. How do you see design education moving forward into remote learning? Do you think, do you see platforms such as Offsite by Advanced Design? Um, are you familiar with Offsite? Yeah. Uh, yeah, a little bit, but yeah. Do you see like online design education platforms like that becoming, um, you know, a replacement of university education? Or do you think there'll always be that foundation of, you know, university education? One of the benefits of a university is, is the really the critical mass um, that it has, you know, as a design school here at QUT, um, you know, we have state of the art facilities. Um, we have a whole range of SLA, SLS, FDM, 3D printers, excellent digital fabrication. We have, um, you know, technicians that can work on those other processes. Um, it's that really um, embedded sort of, um in context learning uh that we can provide mm. um i think it's it's probably possible to develop a, you know some good design skills um offline uh sorry online um pu- purely but you know are they sitting mostly in the digital realm um or are they requiring a lot of requ- requiring a lot of other investments by the students to sort of buy their own facilities or have access to um you know remote services that can sort of run those things um and you know that could kind of fit but having that consolidated learning in an environment is is pretty hard to replicate digitally like getting those sort of experiences yeah there's you know there's probably um enough scope to have both of them Mm. um yeah but i don't necessarily see uh university courses in the way that they're sort of run i guess sort of being um made extinct by by online providers um but they might certainly necessitate adaption so how we adapt to things um again you know what sort of content are we providing is it blended maybe there's some online some in person um yeah but you know there's there's a lot to be said for that um interactive experience that you can get on campus and i i don't think um it's replicated too easily uh in the online experience um you know covid has shown that over over a couple of years um but yeah, there's probably space for both. Um, it just depends what you want to get out of it, really. Mm. I do think one of the big advantages of platforms like that is the chance to like interact with designers from all over the world. So I feel like like even, I mean, in the future, it probably will become a thing, but I feel like that kind of thing implemented into a traditional university education would be really interesting. Like 
you already have remote learning like imagine like all the universities around the world meet up for like a big i don't know vr conference <laughs> like something like that could be really interesting um because i definitely think like something like offsite where you can you know kind of have a classmate who might be in america and you have that connection already and then you have a classmate in england could be really could be really beneficial yeah definitely um you know these are and those sort of experiences are things that we've we've done um to to different degrees in the past um last, i think it was last year um in one of our units mass transportation um we had a collaboration with a university in montreal mm. um where students worked together um actually in gravity sketch mm. so they all got into the same digital environment could have a look at each other's work and they, they ran um a, basically a metaverse exhibition um, <laughs> you know which is pretty cool we we have study tours um over the years um some of those um, in the last couple of years before COVID um, had good integration with Hong Kong Polytechnic, mm. working with students um, on those groups. Um, I ran one with a couple of colleagues where we went to Japan and visited um, places like Jashibi and Tama Art University, yeah. um, interacting with students and, and seeing what they were doing. Um, you know, even, even locally, like we're constantly talking with Monash, with RMIT, sharing those resources, um, you know, understanding best practice. So yeah, there's, there's definitely opportunity, I think, um, to develop those sort of experiences and, and make a much more global classroom. Mm. Um, yeah. In the, in the context, hopefully with, with borders opening, um, you know, in the last little while, um, it, that makes things easier. There's more appetite to do it and there's more scope to do it. Mm, yeah, definitely. Well, yeah, just, just to finish off, what advice would you give to students who are considering a career in industrial design? Um, I mean, I think if you're, if you're considering, give it a crack. Um, you really don't know what it is in, until you start doing it. Um, it you know, it, it's like anything. You, you understand if it works for you. But I can say from experience, I've, I've seen the, the process of, of education, learning to be a designer, learning to be an industrial designer, really sort of shape someone's life, give it, give it really solid meaning and, um, and give it direction. Um, I also think it's, you know, it's just such a, it's such, such a fun and immersive um, education experience. You're, you're constantly working on interesting stuff, producing uh, really interesting outcomes that have value in the world. Um, and as I've sort of outlined increasingly engaging with industry um working on those real world projects um so so give it a shot um absolutely yeah that's great advice well thank you for coming on today levi it's been really great to catch up and yeah i wish you all the best with your future endeavors thanks roman very much appreciate it thank you have a good one